Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and today we'll be covering topic 6.10, which is geothermal energy. Our objective today is to be able to describe the use of geothermal energy in power generation, and also to be able to describe the environmental effects of geothermal energy. The skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video is explaining an environmental concept or process. So we'll start out by just covering the basics of geothermal. So geother geothermal energy refers to this idea that there are radioactive elements in Earth's core, and those radioactive elements give off a ton of heat. This is why Earth's core is so hot, and it's why there is a huge layer of magma in Earth called the mantle. Uh, and that layer of magma is pushed up close to Earth's surface by convection currents. And in certain places, we can drill down deep enough that we can reach naturally hot water deposits that are heated by this magma, or we can pipe water specifically down into these layers to be heated by the proximity of this magma. So it's important to point out, we don't actually drill into the magma itself, but we drill into rock layers that are so close to it that they are extremely hot. So what happens is, again, we can pipe water specifically down into these regions, or we can just tap into naturally occurring reservoirs here in these superheated rock layers. What we can do is pipe this water up to the surface and generate steam. And of course, we should know by now that steam turns a turbine, a turbine powers a generator, and there we have electricity. But we can also just use this as a, sort of, as a source of heat as well. So if we take a look at this diagram, this will help us understand a little bit how we specifically generate electricity uh, from geothermal energy. So again, a little bit of uh, redundancy here, but this is really important to understand. We will pipe water down into these superheated rock layers, or we can access naturally occurring reservoirs of water that are deep in the ground and again are naturally heated by how close they are to this magma in the Earth's mantle. And so what's going to happen then is we're going to be able to bring that water up to the surface as steam. And that steam will, of course, turn a turbine, which powers a generator to generate electricity. Uh, one thing you want to notice that we are going to share in common with uh, nuclear power here is that there's going to be a cooling tower. So this water is going to be extremely hot and some of it will cool and evaporate but eventually we should pipe it back into the ground so that it can be recycled and reused again. So this is a form of renewable energy and that's because the heat from Earth's core is not going to run out. And so as long as we continue to return that water to the ground, this is a renewable and sustainable form of electricity generation. Now we'll talk about a method of home heating and cooling referred to as a ground source heat pump. So one thing I wanna point out is that this is commonly mistakenly referred to kind of in everyday common language as geothermal. And it's not technically geothermal because geothermal, remember, comes from the radioactive decay of Earth's core. So to get true geothermal energy, you have to dig down thousands of meters and access super hot rock layers that are actually heated by magma. When in reality, this is called a ground source heat pump and because it's just that. About 10 feet down in the ground, uh, the Earth stays at a pretty consistent 50 to 60 degree temperature due to the sun's rays that warm it. So even in winter, when it gets below freezing at Earth's surface, or in summer, when it can get upwards of 100 degrees, the ground about 10 feet down stays at that consistent 50 to 60 degrees. And so this can be used strategically both to heat homes in the winter, but to cool them in the summer. So we'll talk about how this works. Basically, what happens is the home will have almost like a second plumbing system added, where there's going to be a pipe and a series of tubes that go down into the ground. And then you have some sort of heat absorbing fluid. Now this will be piped into the ground and it's either going to absorb heat from the ground in the winter to heat your house or pass heat from your home into the ground during the summer to cool your house. Uh, and so let's take a look at how this works with a diagram. So notice again, we have that consistent 50 to 60 degree temperature about 10 feet down in the ground year round. And one more time I wanna highlight, this is due to the sun. Uh, the sun heats Earth's surface and that heat is transferred underground and then we get this consistent temperature. It's not due to the heat from magma, which is the case with true geothermal energy. Um, people just call this geothermal, but it's actually a ground source heat pump. And so again, in the summer, when we could imagine that it might be 80 degrees, your house is going to be very warm. And so this cooling liquid will absorb some of the heat from your house. It will go into the ground and it will give that heat off to the ground because the ground is cooler. And so it returns cool liquid back up to your house to absorb more heat. So you're basically pulling heat out of the air in your house into this cooling liquid, which heats it up, passes it into the ground, and then it gives the heat off to the ground. In the winter, we can actually do the opposite. 
since the ground is going to be warmer than the air in your house, the ground is going to pass heat into your fluid. The fluid is going to come up into your house and transfer that heat into the colder air. And then when the fluid's cold again, it goes back under the ground and picks up more heat. So again, because of this 50 to 60 degree consistent temperature, we can use this strategically to either heat your home in the winter or cool it down in the summer. Now, it is important to point out that we can do true geotheme, geothermal heating, uh, but it's vastly different than a ground source heat pump. And so in true geothermal heating, we're going to pipe water deep, deep, deep into the ground where it's going to be heated by magma. Um, or we can, again, access naturally occurring water reservoirs that are deep in the ground and that are heated by this magma. And then we'll pipe it back up to the surface and we'll transfer that heat from the water to the air of a building to provide heat. Again, different than a ground source heat pump. In a ground source heat pump, we're just taking uh, advantage of that ambient 50 to 60 degree ground temperature versus in geothermal, again, you're going to go down thousands of meters. Um, so you probably don't have a geothermal, a true geothermal uh, heat source in your backyard unless someone drilled down, you know, uh, five kilometers to, to get to that magma uh, heated rock layer. Um, and so if we look at this diagram here, this can help us understand, again, you're going to have to go extremely deep in the earth. And that's because the earth's crust or the lithosphere is pretty thick. So you're not going to be able to go down and reach rocks that are close enough to magma to be heated by digging, you know, a 10 foot hole in your backyard. You're going to have to go down thousands of, of meters. So this is usually a municipal scale project is going to be done, you know, for a city or for a large industrial complex. You're probably not going to put this in your backyard. And so we can see again, this naturally occurring uh, water reservoir here is going to be pretty hot, you know, 160 to 190 Celsius. That's, you know, water boils at hundred Celsius. That's almost double water's boiling point. So you pipe that back up to the surface and then you can distribute it to again, you know, a municipality, so a city or industrial complex, and it can be used to heat their homes. Again, we can also use it for electricity source. And if you're going to go to the trouble of drilling this huge well, oftentimes, you know, that's going to be the case. You'll use it for both. And finally, we'll wrap up today with some quick pros and cons of geothermal energy. So one thing we should know is that geothermal is a great source of potentially renewable energy. Now, of course, the heat source is not going anywhere. We're not going to use, lose the radioactive K from Earth's core. But if we don't return the water to the ground after use, then it isn't necessarily sustainable because we may run out of that groundwater or we may deplete the surface water that we're getting that groundwater for. And so we do have to continue to recycle the water. Uh, there's going to be far, far less carbon dioxide emission from this source of electricity generation than if we use fossil fuels. And then uh, it's not necessarily that we release no air pollutants, but we release far fewer air pollutants. So there's not going to be any particulate matter. There's no SOx or NOx or carbon monoxide. And that's because nothing's being burned. Anytime that the water is heated, you know, by a natural process like geothermal heat, you know, we don't have to combust fossil fuels. And so we're not going to generate those air impurities. Um, the big drawback, one of the big drawbacks, is that this is just not available everywhere. So if we take a look at the map of the U.S., we'll see this is really only going to be available in certain places where our temperature, you know, 7.5 kilometers down, gets hot enough for this to really be feasible. You know, in Michigan or much of the, you know, Great Plains, we can get into, you know, a temperature where water would boil, but it's not going to be hot enough to create super high pressure steam that we can really pipe through a turbine and create electricity in a cost effective way. So that's important to point out. You can't do geothermal just anywhere. You need somewhere where you can access water that's hot enough for this to be, you know, productive. And then one big drawback as well is that there is an air pollutant release and that's hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is lethal to both uh, humans and other animals. And so it could potentially kill people if it builds up into high of concentrations. And so that can be released if, you know, proper ventilation isn't used and if proper, you know, control methods aren't used. And then finally, it is really expensive. So the initial cost is so high because you have to drill deep, 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 deep into the ground. Uh, you have to do a lot of testing, a lot of surveying, find the right place to do this. And so it's not going to be a quick, easy startup, you know, like solar or wind energy. It just requires so much investment or so much capital up front that it can sometimes be cost prohibitive or not really feasible to run. So for practice FRQ 6.10 today, I want you to identify what is the initial source of energy in geothermal power generation. 
and then explain how geothermal systems can be used to actually generate electricity.